Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Claire Reedy, and I'm the Program Manager at the Health Federation of Philadelphia for the Mobilizing Action for Resilient Communities, or MARC, initiative. I'm joined in the room by my colleague, Carolyn Smith-Brown, and we're delighted to be kicking off the MARC Brown Bag webinar series today. Now, before we get started, I have a couple of notes to share. This session is being recorded and will be archived on the MARC website. At the moment, all participants are muted, but we'll be taking questions at the end. Please use your questions pane on the GoToWebinar control panel to share your comments or questions. Mobilizing Action for Resilient Communities is a learning collaborative of 14 cross-sector networks that are using the science of adverse childhood experiences to build the movement for a just, healthy, and resilient world. MARC is coordinated by the Health Federation of Philadelphia with support from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and the California Endowment. You can read more about the communities participating in MARC on our website. We also post monthly to our shared learning series in which you can read about key themes emerging across sites and get related resources. MARC has an impressive National Advisory Committee. I'm sure many of you recognize the names and faces here. And we're very thankful that they have graciously agreed to take on this webinar series. You can visit the MARC Brown Bag webpage to see the webinar lineup access the archives, and register for upcoming sessions, including next week's on community organizing with Katherine Evans-Madden. Today we have the pleasure of hearing from Dr. Sandra Bloom. Sandy really needs no introduction, but I'll go ahead and share it anyway. Dr. Bloom is a board-certified psychiatrist and associate professor of health management and policy at Drexel University's Dornsife School of Public Health. Previously, she served as founder and executive director of the Sanctuary Programs inpatient psychiatric programs for the treatment of trauma-related emotional disorders. Since 2005, several hundred social service, juvenile justice, and mental health organizations have been trained in the sanctuary model, including many of the organizations in the audience today. Dr. Bloom is a past president of the International Society for Traumatic Stress Studies and, co -author, or co and author or co-author of a series of books on trauma-informed care. And last but certainly not least, she's a dear friend and mentor of mine. So, Sandy, thanks so much for joining us today, and I'm going to turn the webinar over to you now. Thanks, Claire. It's a pleasure to be with you. Um, I am so impressed with the work that the MARC communities are doing, and so it's really fun to have an opportunity to share this latest work with you guys, see what you think. So, um, the title I call this is, is Healthy Systems. I think to be a healthy system, the system needs to be both trauma-informed and trauma-responsive. So we are, what all that means is that we are really in the early stages of what we hope will be a major paradigm shift. So paradigm, um, you've heard that word a lot. Uh, what it means is a philosophical or theoretical framework that's based on mental models. And mental models are the assumptions that actually determine what we can think about, what we feel, and what we do. They're shared by other people, but they're usually outside of our individual conscious awareness. So they, they're the things that help our brains automatically organize information. And they're kind of scary to change those basic mental models. The way my colleague Joe Fotorero framed that way back when, um, when we were trying to figure out how we had all changed as clinicians, he said, you know, we've stopped asking people what's wrong with you, and now we ask them what happened to you, and it changes everything. So the older paradigm that's dominated group life, even though maybe you've never thought about that for at least 200 years, is a model that sees the organizations uh, in our society and the, where we work as machines, a machine model of organizations. And that's what's changing. The newer model is that of organizations as alive, possessing the basic requirements of any living system, and having a scientific underpinning for this new worldview, which is based on biology and evolutionary biology, systems theory, cybernetics, the latest um, ideas in physics, quantum theory and non-locality, complexity theory, and 
emergence. So it's not just a crazy idea. There's a lot of foundation for thinking about our organizations as living systems. The ideas, though, go back into the 70s at least. Um, so living systems theory is this general theory that um, about how all systems are living. They have a structure. They interact. They have certain behavior, and they develop over time. And they have to be understood as a whole, um, which consists of separate parts. And each part then affects every other part. And they and one emerges out of the other. So this was the one of the original works around this, starting with the cell and going all the way up to, and it, it could go lower um, into atoms, and it could go higher into the universe, but I, I didn't have enough circles, there wasn't enough room. So you get the idea. What's One of the things that's important about that is that living systems adapt in order to survive. They have to. And um, they adapt in different ways. So if you look at the, the um, tree that's being bent over by the snow load, once the sun melts that, the tree will probably go back to its standing up position unlike the opposite tree, where it's going to be a lot harder to get that back up towards the sun. And here's a tree that is responded to these in the middle, to both trying to get to the sun and also being blown over by the wind. And then in the bottom, these two trees that have pretty extreme adaptations by early environmental influences that happen to them. That's important because I think it relates to healing whether we're talking about individual, group, family, or whole organizational healing. It's more like straightening a tree to grow toward the sun, where you have to brace it and, and help it get up a little bit at a time so that it doesn't just break. And we learned in treating trauma survivors that we had to, it was like peeling an onion down through the levels of multiple levels of adaptation that they had had to make over time to deal with the circumstances that occurred in their environment. I believe that organizations do the same thing, that like individuals, they are living complex adaptive systems and being alive, they're vulnerable to stress, particularly chronic and repetitive stress. And like individuals, they can be traumatized and the result can be as devastating for a whole organization or a system, a community, as it is for individual people. I think that concept is really important because we call it parallel process. And the definition of that that I use is when two or more systems, whether these consist of individuals, groups, or organizations, have significant relationships with one another, they tend to develop similar thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. And the implication of that is that, wow, whatever we can figure out at one level, maybe it has applicability at another level, and maybe we can bring about change much more rapidly than if we try to deal just with individual um, attempts at teaching people how to do things differently. I think it may be the key to nonviolent revolutionary change as a result of that. Well, that means that you have to know something about the organizational culture wherever you are, and that's where my work um, in the last years has been focused on um, how do you change organizational culture? Because it's the how we do things around here. It's the accumulated wisdom, but it is largely unconscious. It happens because humans come together and create culture within, you know, a few hours. Uh, but as long as it remains unconscious, it's not something that we can deliberately alter. And then there are some fundamental dilemmas for changing culture in living systems that we really fail to understand in most cases the, what they're like, the nature of living systems. Um, therefore, we have a flawed understanding of the nature of how living systems change. And part of the dilemma, no matter what system you're in, is that all change involves risk. The only completely risk-free environment for a living system is uh, being chained to a wall. I was going to say death, but that doesn't make any sense. But you get the picture. Any kind of change involves the risk that it won't go well. And so um, 
in order to really have living systems change, you have to be able to tolerate a certain level of risk. How can you keep that to the minimum? What are the things that we can do to structure things so um, change occurs? Well, it has to begin with a vision. So what's your vision? And, and hopefully um, in your community groups, you've, you have a pretty well articulated starting point. But for any organizational change, that's required. And that means changing the things we're attracted to. We, we, we maintain stability by a, an attractor system um, around us as people, as individuals, as families, as communities. And change requires setting up a new system of attractors. And it might be things like we want less violence, we want more safety, we want less people to be injured, we want to see less turnover, we want to get better results, we want to have more success, we want to have better teamwork and get along better together, we want to have more fun. We want to have more pleasure and satisfaction um, in our lives and in our work lives. But people have to agree on what that new attractor system is going to be. I'd like to see us be attracted to greater levels of health um, in, at an individual level, but also at an organizational and system level. I've used this definition, a state of optimum regulation and adaptive functioning of body, mind, and relationships that depends on, and underscore this, the integration of function. Very important. We are right now currently in a political context in our country that is extremely unhealthy by this definition because there is an utter lack of integration of function. So a healthy system has to have clear and obtainable mission that is driven by, driven by a shared, well-articulated vision that people agree on. To look at a mission-driven, trauma-responsive organization, we're talking about an organization that quite deliberately counteracts the short-term and long-term effects of stress, adversity, and trauma on its managers, its staff, and the people it serves while staying true to its mission, expanding social justice, and improving the health and well-being of all organizational stakeholders. The healthy system has to be driven by a coherent and practiced shared value system because our values define us. The values then have to be modeled by leadership. They can be seen in routine daily behavior, and they need to be embedded in how the organization presents itself to its public and to its stakeholders. Um, the, in the model we use, which is the sanctuary model, we call this, these the sanctuary commitments. We see them as trauma responsive values that apply to everybody and have to apply to all decisions. And that we think these, not as they can have other, other names, um, but that the creating response, trauma responsive systems really requires a coherent set of trauma responsive values. For us, it's a commitment to nonviolence, emotional intelligence, social learning, open communication, social responsibility, democracy, and growth and change. Now, leadership. A healthy system has to have authoritative leaders, not authoritarian authoritative leaders who do their best to model system values, who count on other people's input for decisions, who know who and when to include in decision-making processes, who try to lead consensus whenever it's possible, who set high expectations and reward good performance and don't play favorites, who are able to assume responsibility and acknowledge other people's accomplishments, who value the power that is inherent in organizational culture and know how to use it. There has to be leaders who want to work with decentralized authority and distributed power who can also make decisions when it's time to make decisions. We need to have leaders who promote the self-organizing properties of living organizations and who really 
recognize these ideas that their own system is a living system and all that goes along with that. Leadership in a trauma responsive organization means making a long-term commitment to trauma-informed change. This is not an overnight thing. It's not just a two-year thing. It is a major, major paradigm shift. And leaders who are willing to commit human and non-human practical resource to that effort. And then the leaders have to solicit and organize a representative or implementation team that includes all the different levels in, a, in an organizational hierarchy, including service recipients and people with um, lived experience. Now, just like you going to your <clears throat> doctor for periodic checkups, a healthy system needs periodic checkups. A trauma-responsive organization starts with an internal self-assessment. Things like, would you want to receive services here? Would you want to work here if you knew what it was really like? Really important questions. <clears throat> really sometimes hard and painful questions. You want to look around at what you see. <coughs> Is the place inviting? Is there beauty there? Is it comfortable and clean and orderly? When you call up um, as if you were getting service at the organization, um, do you get the responses that you'd want to have? And then, of course, there are lots and lots of organizational surveys. Arctic is um, specific for a, a trauma-informed organization. And then, over time, the organization has to decide what metrics make sense that are consistent with trauma-informed knowledge, and then uses that knowledge to inform objectives and the change process in an on going way and regularly reviews the metrics to assess uh, sustained change. You know, how do you, how do you keep it going? Another component of a healthy system is that it has to be safe and trustworthy for everybody. Um, and therefore, it has to have uh, mechanisms for restoring safety and trust whenever there's been a breach, which inevitably happens in human groups. And that requires resources that are available to build, maintain, and restore trust when it has been broken. In a trauma-responsive organization, I think the best way to characterize that is as a safety culture. Um, in Sanctuary, we talk about all four domains of safety, physical, psychological, social, and moral safety. So uh, the team needs to be able, so this, the, this circle here is meant to represent um, what I've called the social immune system. And wherever there's a break, that's when trouble gets through. So the team has to be able to assess on an ongoing way, where does our social immune system need repair? And the team has to begin to define what changes may need to uh, occur to create or to maintain a safety culture. And of course, as you can see, it's in part a lot about maintaining safe boundaries. We call that the commitment to nonviolence. A healthy system has well-regulated emotions and is emotionally intelligent, expects that from the people within it. Um, and that means the ability to recognize patterns and understand individual and group dynamics. Whoops, sorry. A trauma-responsive organization to be emotionally intelligent recognizes that emotional dysregulation is primary um, when you've been exposed to trauma and adversity and has tools in place that help promote and expect that everybody will be able to uh, regulate their own emotions. Emotions therefore become honored but not in charge. And there's a recognition that emotions are contagious and easily become collective. And that's what we call an, a commitment to emotional intelligence. A healthy system encourages particip or participation through democratic structures that are designed to minimize the abuse of use of power. It values diversity in all forms, race, age, gender, education, experience, all of it. Um, and the reason is that we need complex solutions to complex problems 
through creativity, innovation, and teamwork that really is only going to arise out of um, the proper uh, use of power. So a trauma responsive organization recognizes that all trauma is about the abuse of use of power. So to avoid re-traumatization, people have to figure out how to constructively use power, both individual and collective power, <clears throat> throughout the entire organization. And the best things human beings have come up with thus far are democratic participatory structures. Um, they're the best protection against abuse of power, and we call that the commitment to democracy. A healthy system is committed to open, honest, and frequent communication. So the team has to develop a communication plan that informs everybody in the organization in an ongoing way and develop materials to inform internal and external stakeholders that embody what needs to be conveyed. And we call that a commitment to open communication, which also draws on, retains, learns from, and uses the corporate memory, the memory of the system, which probably is going to mean that the organizational history has to be reviewed. Um, the founding vision, the history of trauma, the history of loss, failures that have occurred, adaptations that have been made, and successes um, that have been achieved are all part of this history of this living organization, whatever it is. And that's part of the commitment to open communication. A healthy system is a learning organization. This is from um, the man Peter Senge, who first started really writing about that. And he said, in a learning organization, leaders are designers, stewards, and teachers. They are responsible for building organizations where people continually expand their capability to understand complexity, clarify vision, and improve shared mental models. That is, they are responsible for learning. And that's, of course, what you guys have been doing together for almost two years, which is great. Um, to be trauma responsive, education is the most powerful weapon we can use to change the world, said Nelson Mandela. Um, and truer words were never spoken. Um, this is embodied in the commitment to social learning. Everyone in an organization has to be educated in trauma theory, developmental neuroscience, group dynamics, the social determinants of health, um, and a spiritual neuroscience, where all the meaning, moral, existential, religious aspects of um, the way it affects our body and brains come into play. And a trauma-responsive organization has to have routine ways to manage conflict um, because it needs to use all kinds of conflict as opportunities for new learning. And it's always seeking creative, integrative solutions to challenging problems. <clears throat> but as um, Yoda said, you will not unlearn what you have learned. A healthy system has to know how to unlearn what it already is doing. And so key questions for any trauma responsive organization is what should we keep? What should we eliminate? And what should we do that's new? And all of that is uh, for us part of the commitment to social learning. As, as is looking at our standard operating procedures, policies, all of it um, reviewed for consistency with the organizational mission and trauma responsive values. And they're incorporated into interviewing, hiring, orientation, basically all human resource practices. Then the healthy system cares about social justice and does its best, never perfect, does our best to walk the talk. Um, to be a trauma responsive organization, there has to be a really deep understanding that this is about human rights. And it's about the human rights of everyone, including children. They're, the personal is political. There's no way to get away from that long-standing feminist notion. And we have a huge body of research now that supports that. Um, and recognizes that trauma exposure can cause the loss of meaning and purpose for people. So we are always having to 
maintain a commitment to respons social responsibility, to strike a balance between the needs of me and the needs of you, the needs of the individual and the needs of, of a group. And then a healthy system shares, uh, develops a shared language for working together, for organizing change, and for solving problems. Um, our shared language happens to be SELF. It stands for safety, emotions, loss, and future. Um, we like it because it's simple enough for anybody, any age, to understand. It conveys at the same time really indispensable ideas about uh, the road to recovery from trauma and adversity. And it becomes a really effective problem organizing and problem solving tool. And we use it um, to maintain a commitment to growth and to change. The other piece of the commitment to growth and change is the issue of loss. Trauma equals loss. And I don't really believe that um, people are resistant to change. I think we're resistant to loss. And every time we make a change, we have to give up something. So if you want somebody or some system to change, you have to honor what they're going to have to give up. Um, and set an expectation that we are going to change because we constantly have to adapt as living systems to um, ongoing environmental change. And then a healthy system knows how to party. Um, to be trauma responsive, to be a healthy system, um, you have to have celebrations. You have to have fun. Laughter is the best medicine. Um, so the system has to routinely look for, find, and celebrate even very small successes and keep orienting itself toward a better future um, and, and moving in the direction and celebrating even the tiniest gains that you make um, in that vision. So we use sanctuary, the sanctuary model as a blueprint um, for organizational change. It's not really a, a recipe. The trauma-informed values, just to summarize, nonviolence, because we need to feel safe in all life dimensions if we're to think complexly. Um, we have to be emotionally intelligent because we need to understand individual and group consciousness and unconsciousness. Um, we have to be learning all the time, and humans learn through trial and error. And we learn best within a context of mutual trust. We need to keep information honest, open, and flowing because secrets make us sick. So we need a commitment to open communication. We need a commitment to democracy because we need to avoid the abuse of use of power, which is endemic. Um, and that means you have to have wide participation. Um, and that is how you solve complex problems. We have to maintain a sense of social responsibility, again, balancing our own individual needs and desires with those of the collective good. And we need to be committed to growth and change um, and recognize that all change requires loss. And it won't happen on, unless we have a vision of where we want to go, how we want to grow. So I think at this point in time, we need, um, and you've heard me use the notion of trauma responsive. Um, I kind of think as a public health person now, and I think in primary, secondary, and tertiary terms. And primary, I think we need to um, have everybody, and I mean everybody, have um, knowledge about trauma, adversity, and its effects on living systems. And I think that's, for me, what trauma-informed means. Everybody needs to be trauma-informed. Then secondary interventions are, you know, directed usually at at-risk populations. And this are, that means all of us. Policies and practice that are in place that minimize damage and maximize opportunities for healthy growth and development in all populations at risk and that provide a context within which healing and recovery can occur. And then tertiary, really trauma-specific. So focus on what it takes really for healing and recovery, to free up ener energy, um, integrate a full biographical narrative, um, and the safe exploration of new modes of being, of adapting. 
So I guess my, my summary point on this is that becoming trauma responsive and helping to heal one's organization is not for the faint of heart. It is indeed a paradigm shift that is a, it's a biggie. And um, I wanted to share with you one of my um, heroes was Maxwell Jones, who was one of the founders of the democratic therapeutic community. He was a Scottish um, psychiatrist uh, during and after World War II. And he said, in the field of mental health, most attention has been given to psychotherapy, some to mental hygiene, but very little as yet to the design of a whole culture which will foster healthy personalities. So those are my three books. That's me. I'm going to go back to you. And uh, there I am. Hi. Thank you wow. so much, Andy. That yeah, I kept, I kept a time. Yes, so I need did. some questions, guys. <laughs> yeah, so we do have one question for you already. And that was um, a request for more resources on where folks can learn about spiritual neuroscience. Mm. There, are, there's a lot of there's um, there's a lot of material out there. There's even a on the great courses. There's a whole um, there's a whole series of lectures that a guy from Penn does. I can't think of the, there's a bunch of books about it. Um, I, can't, I can't think of them off the top of my head. I think I have some of them listed in the beginning of Creating Sanctuary. I've got them somewhere, but they're not popping into my head. But it's, it's really interesting work about how meaning and purpose is important to how we um, manage our own biology. Great. Okay, thank you. And if you get that list to me, I'm happy to um, share it with the group. Okay. Uh, so the next question is, can you talk a little bit about authentic power sharing specific to how it relates to the architecture of our roles as helping professionals? I'm not exactly sure how to answer that. I guess I'll, um, power sharing is really asking other people to be part of any kind of decision that gets made and determining who needs to be included in the decision making process, who need, because it's affecting them less, who needs to be just informed, and then who needs to be, can be told after the fact because it really doesn't have any impact on their lives. That's, those are important leadership management decisions that need to be made in an ongoing way. Um, and then as helping professionals, I think we set an example in the way we conduct ourselves with our teammates and in the relationship with our um, clients, um, how we share that um, kind of power, even the power to, oh, I, as a physician, I think about, um, you know, prescribing a medication. There are some doctors that just expect people to do what they tell them to do without actually finding out the impact that the medication is having on them. And, and that conversation, when it occurs, is a form of power sharing. So if, you, if the questioner could be a little more specific, I can probably be a little more specific myself. Uh, thanks, Sandy. And I, uh, I'm happy to put you in touch with the, the questioner afterwards. Uh, she's a member of our MARC community. Uh, but I do want to move on to some of the other questions that we've gotten. So one is that uh, there's a, quite a bit of focus on the role of leadership. So what if leadership doesn't have these skills or the desire for the change? <laughs> I think your next brown bag is about resistance. <laughs> so that's, um, that's, that's tough. I think um, 
leaders, we have an awkward situation in um, the helping professions in that people often get put in leadership positions because supposedly we're good with people. Uh, it doesn't mean we're good managers. But the two are often, um, they are, seem to be understood as if they're the same thing, and they're not. So once you get put into that position, then you're going to be really afraid to um, recognize that maybe you don't know what the hell you're doing and to be able to be honest with people about that. So um, I think it's, it's kind of thinking about stages of change. So if you have a leader who has a hard time with this, then informing them, um, giving them information, um, kind of keep the information going, um, being willing to, to talk about it, asking for discussions about things. Um, that are not too provocative, that are not going to scare the person too much, until gradually what you hope for is that um, they come to understand that there is um, a great deal that benefits leaders by taking on board a more participatory structure. Um, it's scary at first to give up um, some sense of that you, you have to make all the decisions. That can be scary, but as long as other people are willing to pick up the slack, what you find is that, wow, you don't have to do everything. That you can count on other people and count on your team. And that's a process of trust building. So it's a little bit of time. It's kind of more like therapy. Um, so it, it's a little bit of time. It's always harder to do because you're lower on the hierarchy than the person that you're trying um, to bring around, but they're just people, um, and they want to be successful, and they want to be liked, um, and whatever is the problem, they just don't know how to do it. So try to give them some hints, encourage even small successes, uh, just like we do with our clients, and um, move along, follow the stages of change ideas that you do some things when somebody's at one point of development and other things um, when they get to a new point of development. And then, I mean, there are some really dysfunctional people in place who should not be. And um, if, if you cannot affect upward, what you can always affect is uh, people on your own, uh, on your own level. And the, the stronger the teamwork, the healthier the organization is below, then the less impact dysfunctional leadership can have, and it makes it, the climate becomes such that they don't want to be there anymore. So, you know, I just covered a very wide, wide range of um, what we mean by problems in leadership, but I always think it's best to to give people the benefit of the doubt first and do what you can to help bring them along. Thanks, Sandy. And in that response, you actually addressed one of the other questions, which was about um, whether or not the change can come from the team rather than um, leadership. So yeah. there's another um, series of questions that have to deal with social determinants of health and health equity, the role of health equity in trauma-informed systems. So um, let's start with uh, helping to identify or describe the connection between community level trauma and the social determinants of health. Well, uh, I, I, I think the, all the research on the social determinants of health um, can quite naturally be integrated into the notion of um, increased allostatic load, toxic stress, and traumatic stress. So, um, you know, if you are subjected to poverty, to racism, sexism, ageism, any of the isms that are, um, you know, part of the structural makeup of our culture, then it's possible to not have it be a separate discourse, but have it be an integrated 
discourse in helping people understand how broad and endemic these problems are. That it's not just some population of people. It's it's everybody. And you know, if you're white, you may be affected it by different things than if you're a person of color. But their the the stuff they go through is going to affect the way the whole culture responds and affect you too. So it's not, you know, again. I think a system model is all about integration, and that includes integrating the knowledge, not denying it, um, not denying that people who live in poverty have special problems that if you're well-resourced, you don't have. And people of color have to deal with uh, the systematic racism that um, if you're white, you don't have to. So you can acknowledge all that and make it real and make sure you include the voices and thereby increase everybody's awareness of just how toxic all of these negative um, influences are and what they're doing to therefore our health as a whole society. So I, I, I'm I hope I'm addressing that, that question, but that's, that's where I put it in my context because it's so vital, but I don't want to increase discrimination while I don't want to, at the same time, increase denial, if that makes any sense. Okay. Thanks, Sandy. Um, so we'll have uh, time for a couple more. So the next one is, how do we help people regulate emotions in a work setting when we all come with various abilities to do so? The workplace has to set a, um, an expectation uh, that um, everybody has to have a safety plan. So um, in our organizations, everybody, and I do this with my classes, um, um, in the, at the university. So <clears throat> one of the early things we do in class is everybody has to create a safety plan. And that's about, it's really simple. It's a simple process. You know, what, what emotions are particularly bothersome for me? What are the triggers that are likely to set me off? How do I get into a jam when I, you know, lose control of my emotions? And what are the five simple things I can do? Could be three, could be seven, doesn't matter. Um, what are the five simple things I can do to um, manage my emotions? And then we share each other's safety plans. And then people get different ideas from each other. And then you can help somebody when you know, when you can see them starting to lose it. You can step in because you know what their safety plan is and offer some help. And it uh, sets a norm um, within an organization that everybody that that everybody is expected to manage their emotions, and we're expected to help each other. So it's simple things that um, are really critical. And I every I'm working with undergrads and graduate students, and they always come to me later or talk later in class about how they've how they need it, and how they use their safety plans. Well, Sandy, I see that we're out of time. We do have a few more questions in the queue, so I'm going to do my best to um, get those questions to you and see if we can just have an offline conversation about a few of them. But for everyone else in the audience, um, there's been a lot of questions about whether or not this session has been recorded or if we'll have the slides. So the answer to the first one, yes, it's been recorded, and it will be archived on the MARC website, um, on the brown bag page. And Sandy, if it's OK with you, or would we be able to post your slides there as well? Yeah, I can do it as a PDF. OK, great. Thank you. So um, again, everyone, we're having a, a session next week on June 20th with Katherine Evans Madden. This is part of the MARC Brown Bag webinar series. Sandy, it was a real honor and pleasure to have you join us today. Um, I thank you for all the work that you're doing and um, all the guidance that you're providing for the MARC communities as well. So I oh, hope everyone. Yeah. Bye, everybody. It's great to see you, kind of. Thanks. Thanks, Sandy. Bye. Have a great rest of your day, everybody.